Hello and welcome to my next video on transport in animals. Types of transport systems. Now in the last video on exchange surfaces in the lungs we talked about why we need transport systems. It's because with a large organism they have a very small surface area to volume ratio so since they are big they need to get all their energy to all over their body. Diffusion isn't good enough. So you have a transport system, in this case the circulatory system, which transports stuff like oxygen or glucose, other solutes around the body in the blood. Now, there are two types of circulatory system. There's a single circulatory system and a double circulatory system. In the single circulatory system, you have the heart, which is not accurately drawn which will take blood, in this case it's usually found in fish, will take blood to the gills to become oxygenated. The blood will then go to the rest of the body, deposit its oxygen, and deoxygenated blood will go back to the heart, then to the gills, and it goes in that cycle. In a double circulatory system, the blood firstly flows to the lungs, where it's oxygenated, and then flows back to the heart, where it is then pumped again around the rest of the body. The circulatory system that goes to the specifically to the lungs, so heart, lungs, heart, is the pulmonary, pulmonary system. And the one that goes from the heart to the rest of the body is the systemic. The main advantage of having a double circulatory system is that you have increased pressure and it's faster and more efficient. So in the fish's one, the blood is pumped under high pressure to the gills and then the rest of the body. So it's already lost some of that pressure. In the double circulatory system, it goes to the lungs and is oxygenated, but then comes back to the heart and is pumped out again under high pressure to the rest of the body. Another two ways of another way of classifying circulatory systems is whether they are open and closed. Open is essentially they are not always in vessels, closed is that they are always in vessels. So closed is what we have, mammals and most animals. You have a heart will then go to an artery arteries take blood away from the heart then it gets small into an arterial then capillaries which are the smallest then venules then vein then back to the heart open is when you have kind of like little chambers for the heart and it will then the blood will just be released into the whole body and eventually will flow back into the chambers now each chamber of the heart has a valve to prevent backflow. We will look at that a bit later. This is generally what is found in insects. So the heart, and here you go. Um, after this slide I've had to get some actual diagrams in because I'm not good enough a drawer. But I'll start off with a little bit of information. So valves. There's the atrioventricular, which is the one between the atria and the ventricle, and the semilunar, which is between any arteries in the heart so the pulmonary artery for example is one of them but um, also one such as the the aorta now how these act is a lot of how the circulatory system works is to do with pressure so as you can see they're kind of like a little flap if blood is going through with in the same direction which the valve is facing blood will just th flow through. If the blood tries to come back though, it will push against the sides of the valve and the valve will close preventing blood coming back. And that is how all valves work and there is quite a few of them such as in veins. Now how pressure is created in the heart, there are four kind of central sections of the heart. There are atria and ventricles. Now, as we'll see in a minute, two atria on top, two ventricles on the bottom, you have the left and right atria, left and right ventricle. Now, the atria have the thinnest wall, the right ventricle has the next thickest, and the left ventricle has the thickest wall. You'll see that in the diagram we show next. But the reason why is that the left ventricle has to push blood throughout the whole body. The right ventricle has to push blood to the lungs, the left atrium has to push blood to the left ventricle. The right atrium has to push blood to the right ventricle. So now we'll have a look at the picture. 
So here is the heart. Now it's a lot there, but as you can see, it shows all the sec sections. If you look at the bottom, that's going to be the confusing, bottom right of the picture, you have the left ventricle, which you can see is the thickest wall. The right ventricle then is the next thickest wall. You then have the right atrium, the left atrium is slightly thinner. Now, this diagram explains it quite well, but I will basically try and explain it. They all, so, this is kind of how blood circulation goes. You get blood from the body, goes into the vena cava, and you have the vena cava superior and inferior. Su superior is the one at the top, inferior is the one at the bottom. The one at the bottom takes blood, which is basically from the bottom half of the body into the heart, and then the superior one takes blood from the top half of the body into the heart. Now this carries deoxygenated blood into the right atrium. The right atrium will then push blood into the left, sorry, right ventricle, right atrium into the right ventricle, which is then pushed into the pulmon pulmonary artery. Now arteries are always carrying blood away from the heart and in every case apart from the pulmonary artery they carry oxygenated blood but in this case they carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs where they are reoxygenated and they come back through the pulmonary vein which then the blood flows into the left atrium and then into the left ventricle which pushed up through the aorta and then it goes to the rest of the body so I hope that makes sense but basically look at the diagram you can see the direction the blood flows but it goes deoxygenated blood to the vena cava goes into the right atrium right ventricle pulmonary artery lungs pulmonary vein right, uh, left atrium left ventricle aorta rest of the body next the cardiac cycle now this is the cycle of actually blood being pumped around the body now again i'll explain it and then i'll show the diagram so you have three sections, you have atrial systole, ventricular systole, and diastole. Systole is when they are contracting, diastole is basically rest. Now this is another important bit for pressure. So, atrial systole. The ventricles are relaxed, the atria filled with blood which decreases their volume, now you decrease the volume of something but have the same amount of stuff in it you will increase the pressure the higher pressure in the atria causes the atrioventricular valves to open allowing the blood to flow into the ventricles one point i did not mention is that the the direction the valves work in if you remember the diagram we had the two little flaps pointing one direction so blood could go in that direction the valves work in the direction from atria to ventricles not ventricles to atria that's and the semilunar ones work from ventricles to whatever artery they're going into anyway the atria then contract decreasing their volume and increasing the pressure as we said if you decrease the volume and increase the pressure well you decrease the volume increase pressure this happens even further and forces blood the remaining blood out because the pressure is higher in the atria than in the ventricles, so pressure gradient is formed, so blood flows down into the ventricles. Ventricular systole. The ventricles contract and the atria relax. The pressure is higher in the ventricles than the atria because the volume is just increased in the ventricles and decreased in the atria. Now, this would mean that the pressure gradient is formed that blood will flow from the ventricles to the atria but that doesn't happen because of the valves the blood will be pushed against the atrioventricular valves the valves will close and then no backflow will occur the high pressure in the ventricles opens the semilunar valves which are from the ventricles to the arteries and blood is forced out in this case into the pulmonary artery and aorta depending on which side if it is the right ventricle is the pulmonary artery if it's the left ventricle it's the aorta and then diastole the ventricles and atria both relax increasing their volume and lowering the pressure in the heart chambers the higher the higher pressure in the pulmonary artery and aorta causes semilunar valves to close preventing backflow because again it'll want to go back into the ventricles because they are low pressure the aorta and 
pulmonary artery at high pressure, creating a pressure gradient, but the valves will close. Then the atrial will fill with blood again due to high pressure in the vena cava and pulmonary vein because blood is starting to flow back and the cycle will start all over again. And now here's the picture. As you can see, now you can't have systole occurring in two places at once. So systole only occurs in the atria, not the ventricles, then only in the ventricles and not the atria. And you can see the length of time Systole in the ventricles is longer than the systole in the atria. And you can see here that the blood is flowing down into the from the atria into the ventricles, then ventricles into the arteries, and then when all chambers are relaxed, you can see how it flows back into the atria. You can see how that works then. It's I've I've explained it fully, that's the picture. If you need to rewind it and listen to the explanation again with this picture in mind. So next, control of the cardiac cycle. Another picture after this. Cardiac muscle is myogenic. That means it can contract and relax without receiving signals from nerves. And this is basically is the control of the heart rate. Now, we've if anyone doing A2, or when you do A2 next year probably, um, you learn about how the brain controls heart rate because you can control the rate at which the heart contracts but you the brain can't actually control make it start and make it stop only increase the speed the thing that controls whether the cardiac cycle stops is the sinoatrial node san also known as the pacemaker it will send out a wave of excitation this causes the atria to contract because as you'll see in the next slide the sinoatrial node is right at the top of the right atrium it will cause a wave of excitation to go across the atria, causing them both to contract and push blood down into the ventricles. Now, what stops is this wave of excitation, electrical impulse essentially, going through straight into the ventricles, is that nearly all the um, cells between the atria and ventricles are non-conducting collagen tissue. But there is one little bit it can get through. So next, the wave excitation reaches the atrioventricular node, the AVN. Now this is in the lower half of the right atrium, just above the kind of wall of the heart. Now this takes in the wave of excitation, but kind of pauses it. So there's a little electrical delay, because if you had the atria and the ventricles contract at the same time, the blood wouldn't go anywhere. You need to contract the atria first, blood goes, all the blood goes into the ventricles, then contract the ventricles. Now, uh, the wave of excitation is released from the AVN and travels down some special conductive tissue called the perkine tissue, also known as the Purkinje tissue, or the bundle of his. I'll be referring to it as the perkine tissue. It goes all the way down to the apex of the heart, where it then goes up the walls of the ventricles, causing the wave of excitation to go from the bottom of the ventricles upwards. So the con so contraction occurs from the bottom upwards, meaning that blood is pushed upwards into the arteries, which is very important. So if, you, if it contracts from the top, it will just be pushed down and could be dangerous. And this is where the wall creates bigger pressure. So we'll now have a look at that. As you can see, the sinoatrial node right at the top of the right atria. The, the atrioventricular node is at the bottom of the right atrium. You then have, and I see here they've they've done it Purkinje, but that's fine. You have the atrioventricular bundle, which is the start of the perkine tissue. It then goes down the septum. That's the bit in between the um, left and right walls or chambers. So it goes down there to the bottom where it then starts going up. And then that is where the um, ventricles contract from. So I hope that makes sense. Now, looking at the cardiac cycle, electrocardiograms, also known as ECGs, these are made by an electrocardiograph. Make sure you know the difference. Now, these are also known as PQRST waves. 
and I will explain what each bit is. The three main sections is the P, the QRS complex, and the T section. The P wave, now just let you know, you can see it's electrical activity. So the higher the peak, the more electrical activity is going on. So at P, there's a little bit of electrical activity as the atria contract. Then QRS, that is the main peak of the heartbeat, together with the dips on either side, it's called the QRS complex, it's called by the contraction of the ventricles. And then at T is due to relaxation of the ventricles, and that's the little bump there. Now we'll explain that a little bit more. So P is the contraction of the atria. P to R is the bit in between the travel of the wave of excitation from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node. And then R to T is the time taken for the wave to go down the perkine tissue and then systole occurs. And yeah. Blood vessels, another picture after this. There are three main types, arteries, capillaries, and veins. You have a type which is in between artery and capillary, which is arterial, which is a small artery, and a type between capillary and vein, which is a small vein, which is a venule. So all blood vessels have a very similar sort of structure. They're cylindrical and have something called a lumen, that is the center, and will have a wall of some sort. The artery has a small lumen to maintain high pressure because this is blood going away from the heart so it needs to be under high pressure. They also have a thick and mus they are thick walls, muscular, have elastic tissue and we'll go over that. So they're a thick wall of collagen. Now this is to give it strength to withstand high pressure. There's elastic tissue or elastic fibers, which as we um, said what elastic fibers do is they will allow the lumen to stretch as more blood flows into it and then recoil which helps with increasing the pressure or keeping the pressure high as blood is pushed out. Now this is felt as a pulse in areas where the arteries lie close to the skin so the recoil maintains the high pressure. The smooth muscle that can contract and constrict the artery so it can narrow the lumen so particularly like think of arterioles well if you're doing A2 in homeostasis arterioles near the skin you have vasoconstriction which is when they constrict to prevent blood flow near the skin, so you don't lose heat from the blood, and vasodilation is when the smooth muscle will um, relax so that it can allow blood to flow near the skin and radiate heat for those doing A2. And then you have endothelium. Now this is folded in the center of the lumen, which we'll look at. This is just so it is has that space to stretch when more blood flows into it. Capillaries, we'll come back to them. We'll do the vein next. Vein. This has a much larger lumen to allow ease, allow lots of blood flow and also under lower pressure because um, you don't need high pressure returning to the heart. The walls have thinner layers of collagen, smooth muscle, elastic tissue because they do not need to stretch and recoil and are not actively constricted to reduce blood flow because essentially they're just returning black blood back we do not need to increase the pressure or push it nearer the skin or anything like that the main feature is that they have valves as we explained to prevent backflow because for example arteries will take blood down the leg to the feet veins will return it you generally arteries pretty much all circumstances will be taking blood down there might be a little bit so from the heart to the shoulder will be going up but then it's down to the hand the only place it really goes up is to the brain and the head but that since it's under so much pressure it doesn't matter it won't come back down with the constant pressure but with the vein as it tries to come back up, up the leg under much lower pressure it could easily just stop and go back down now the way you print this is the veins um, the veins have valves and the valves are stop backflow as we've explained it also has a non-folded endothelium the capillary, one cell thick, it's made of endothelium cells and has a very narrow lumen about the size of a blood cell, red blood cell, which is 7 micrometers. So here are the blood vessels. On the left you have the vein, on the right you have the artery. On the artery you can see endothelium, then elastic tissue, smooth muscle, more elastic tissue. And they've called it fibrous connective tissue, but that's essentially collagen would be there. And on the vein on the left, you have 
fibrous connective tissue, external elastic tissue, smooth muscle, internal, and then endothelium. Now you can see that basically the important thing here is the width of the lumen or diameter is larger in the vein. Don't take any notes of the bottom bit, but this is just to show you roughly what the blood vessels look like. Now, so we looked at blood, now we're going to go from tissue fluid, which is essentially blood, but it's slightly different. Tissue fluid is the fluid that surrounds cells in tissues. It's made from surfaces that leave the blood, oxygen, water, nutrients. Cells take in oxygen and nutrients from the tissue fluid and release metabolic waste into it. In, in a capillary bed, the network of capillaries in an area of tissue, substances move out of the capillaries into the tissue fluid by pressure filtration. So essentially, you have capillaries, things will diffuse out of the capillaries or be put either by a just a diffusion gradient, concentration gradient, or pressure gradient, usually pressure. And we'll go into this tissue fluid which kind of surrounds the cells. The cells will then take in the nutrients they need from the tissue fluid. So I'm going to explain how the whole of a kind of tissue fluid, how substances are moved in and out of the capillaries from tissue fluid. So we have here a blood vessel. You start at the arteriole, which is the artery end, and you have the venule end, so the vein end. And in the middle will be where the capillary is. Now, when you're in the arteriole, the blood is still under quite high pressure. We call it hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure will tend to push the blood out of the capillaries. But you also have a water potential gradient. So you have a pressure gradient, that's hydrostatic pressure pushing the blood out of the capillaries. And you have water potential gradient, which pushes the uh, tissue fluid back in the capillaries. Now, the water potential gradient is caused because in the blood there's, there's more stuff in the blood that isn't water, so it lowers the water potential. So, at the arterial end, it's under high pressure and the blood will be pushed out under hydrostatic pressure. The hydrostatic pressure is more powerful in terms of pressure than the osmotic potential or the effect of water potential going in. So the overall effect is that's a net outflow. In the venule end, when the pressure is decreased, there's still some hydrostatic pressure pushing stuff out down the pressure gradient, but the osmotic potential because a lot more um, substances have been used at the venule end, so oxygen, glucose, stuff like that, that it's a lot, the water potential has increased in the tissue fluid. There's more just water. So it will flow into the venule. There's a net inflow. Now this can be, this is probably the most confusing thing in this unit, I personally think, or something a bit later in this chapter. But um, essentially, hydrostatic pressure pushes water out, or pushes blood out rather, pushes blood out, um, then osmosis will cause the tissue fluid to be pushed back in. At the arterial end, there's more hydrostatic pressure pushing stuff out than water potential gradients pushing stuff back in, so there's net outflow. At the venule end, there's still some hydrostatic pressure pushing stuff out, but there's more water potential gradients that is pushing stuff back in, so it's a net inflow. At both the arterial and venule end, stuff is being pushed out and in. It's the net outflow or inflow. Lymph. Some tissue fluid enters lymph capillaries. So the moment it enters the lymph capillaries, it is called lymph. And this is at the vein end of the capillary bed. I mean, sorry, it doesn't. Well, at the vein end of the capillary bed, not all tissue fluid will re-enter the capillaries. Some is left over and will get returned to the blood through the lymphatic system. Lymph vessels contain valves, just so to prevent backflow, because it all needs to go in one direction. And it moves towards the main lymph node in the thorax, it's near the collarbone. And then it's returned to the heart and is reused. So this is just what is contained in blood, tissue fluid and lymph. In blood, you have red blood cells. In tissue fluid and lymph, you don't. And the reason why red blood cells fit inside the um, capillaries, but they are too big to be squeezed out. So tissue fluid doesn't contain it. Tissue fluid then becomes lymph, so no red blood cells there. In the blood, you have white blood cells. 
Now a few of these can get squeezed out into the tissue fluid, but not as much. And then in lymph contains white blood cells naturally, lymphocytes. So that has nat nat naturally has white blood cells. Platelets, same thing as red blood cells. It's in the blood, not tissue fluid or lymph. Proteins, very similar again. It's in the blood. A few get into the tissue fluid, but not many, only the smaller ones. And in lymph, a few mainly antibodies, though. Yet again, the lymphatic system, lymphocytes. Water is in all of them, and dissolved solutes such as ions, stuff like that, they are all in there as well. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what you find contained in blood. It's a protein, it's got two alpha chains, two beta chains of amino acids, blah, 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 blah. Now, each chain in the hemoglobin has a heme group. This contains iron, which makes it red. Iron is Fe, more specifically Fe2+, which is an iron ion. And it means that it can it's missing two electrons. Well, no, not that it's missing, but it has lost two electrons. Meaning it's got a positive charge. Hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. Each molecule can carry four oxygen molecules because there are four heme groups. So we'll call hemoglobin HB. One HB can combine with four O2 to form HbO8. In the lung, oxygen joins the iron and hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. This is a reversible reaction. When oxygen leaves oxyhemoglobin, it disassociates and it's near the body cells and becomes hemoglobin again. Now, we call par partial pressure of oxygen a partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So, the partial pressure of oxygen, PO2 as we call it, is a measure of oxygen concentration. The greater the concentration, the higher the partial pressure. We have the same with carbon dioxide, which is PCO2. Hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen depends on the partial pressure. Oxygen loads onto hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin when there's a high partial pressure, and it unloads when there's a lower one. So think of concentration gradients. When there's a high concentration of oxygen, it'll load on. Low concentration, it loads off. Now, this happens for any chemists due to a substitution reaction because iron is naturally bonded to water. Oxygen will replace the water molecules for anyone doing A2 chemistry. And I'm only mentioning that because I've only recently learned about that, but it's very interesting. So oxygen enters blood capillaries at the alveoli in the lungs. Alveoli, alveoli have a high partial pressure of oxygen, so it loads onto hemoglobin. When cells respire, they use up oxygen this lowers the partial pressure of oxygen, so red blood cells deliver the oxyhemoglobin to respiring tissues where it unloads oxygen so they can continue to respire. Carbon dioxide transport. Now, we've talked about how oxygen gets to cells, but obviously carbon dioxide is released. How do we get rid of it? Now, firstly, about 5% is dissolved directly in the blood plasma, and 10% combines with hemoglobin, 85% is transported in hydrogen carbonate ions, we'll look at that in a minute. So, carbon dioxide is released by respiring cells. It combines with water, now this happened in the red blood cell, it diffuses into the red blood cells, carbon dioxide, and combines with water in them. And then this will form carbonic acid using the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. This carbonic acid will initially disassociate to form a proton, H+, and a carbonic, well, sorry, um, hydrogen carbonate ion. That's HCO3-. minus. Now, the HCO3- minus can just will just leave the cell, will diffuse out of the red, red blood cell and be transported into blood. Now, to make sure that the charge doesn't suddenly change, chlorine ions, which have a 1- minus charge, as do HCO3-, minus, so chlorine diffuses into the cell, HCO3 minus diffuses out, keeping the charge kind of gradient. This is called the chlorine shift. Now we've got the H plus. Ignore that for a minute, and then go to the bottom. You have oxyhemoglobin. It will release four oxygen molecules, which will be respired, and then you will have hemoglobin. That's where you get hemoglobin form from. Then H plus ions combine with hemoglobin to form hemoglobinic acid. 
Now the reason we have this hemoglobinic acid is that it acts as a buffer solution. A buffer solution is one that resists change to pH because pH is controlled by H plus ions. Increased concentration of H plus ions increase or decrease the uh, pH, which you don't want to do. Hemoglobinic acid mops up the protons. Basically, it just maintains the pH. Don't need to worry about the chemistry of that. It just maintains the pH. And then 10% of the carbon dioxide, so some of that HCO3, um, some of the carbon dioxide rather, is combined directly with hemoglobin to form carb carbamino hemoglobin. Now this is very complicated, so I just listen to it again, I suggest this, because it is very com complicated. Anyway, and last section now, disassociation curves. Now, a disassociation curve shows how saturated the hemoglobin is with oxygen at any given time. Now, the graph is S-shaped because when hemoglobin combines to the first oxygen molecule, its shape alters in a way which makes it easier to get oxygen. So we have hemoglobin's natural shape, it accepts an oxygen molecule, changes shape, can accept another oxygen molecule easier. And then it's the next two molecules join on quite easily. So you've now got three molecules but then it changes shape again, making it slightly harder to get the fourth one. So that's why it levels off at the end. So it changes shape, so it gets easier for the first for the first one joins. The next two get easier to join. The fourth one is harder to join. Now, fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin. Now, this is why, because the fetus needs to be better at absorbing blood from its oxygen from its mother's blood because when the blood has reached the fetus in the mother it will already gone through a reasonable amount of the body so there'll be less there'll be a lower partial pressure of oxygen there's less oxygen there some has been used so it has a high affinity so it can take oxygen on easier when there is a lower partial pressure of oxygen and finally adult hemoglobin with a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide now this is carbon dioxide concentration affects oxygen upload unloading. Now this is a very confusing section. When you have carbon dioxide, it will disassociate to form a proton and a hydrogen carbonate ion. The proton combines with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has a higher affinity for hydrogen ions than oxygen, so hydrogen ions displace oxygen, so oxygen is more readily unloaded. That means you need a higher partial pressure of oxygen to actually allow it to be taken on by the haemoglobin. So when there's more carbon dioxide, essentially more hydrogen, more hydrogen ions will form, so they'll take up space for haemoglobin, so more oxygen is released. And that is that. This is a, particularly at the end, this can be quite confusing, especially to explain, actually. So I suggest any bits you don't get, firstly, listen to them again, perhaps with a book in front of you to get the diagram. And if you still don't understand, please ask me to explain it in writing. It might be a little bit easier. Anyway, in conclusion, you have an open and closed circulatory system and single and double circulatory systems. The main part of the circulatory system is the heart, which undergoes the cardiac cycle. That is atrial um, systole, ventricular systole, and diastole. It's controlled by the SAN and the VAN. You have blood vessels. You have arteries, veins, capillaries. Now you have bloods which are contained in the blood vessels, you have tissue fluid outside and lymph in the lymphatic system and the thing that takes on oxygen is haemoglobin. So thank you for watching, comment, like, subscribe, whatever and please email me if you have any questions. Thank you and goodbye.